very good morning. As you see, the message this morning is God's plumb line. I had a plumb line. I couldn't find it. Otherwise, I would have brought it. But I thank God for those who printed this bulletin. There's a picture of a plumb line on that picture. We'll talk about that later. Firstly, I want to ask you a question. Who would you consider is a safe pilot? All of you have flown, most of you have flown. What is it that you would consider a pilot to be safe? Anybody? Good looks? No. What do you think? What? Say again. Good experience. Good experience. Good experience. Okay, good. Anyone else? Michael, you you fly. Any, any pilot that can walk away from the landing is a good pilot. Okay. <laughs> okay, any pilot who can walk away from the landing is a good pilot. Not drunk. Not drunk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We have different perceptions of what a good pilot is. You know, I've been involved for many years in training. And you know who I consider? A good pilot? Yes, of course, he walks away after every landing. Of course, he, a pilot is good if he has a lot of experience, but that alone is not sufficient. In our training, we train pilots to follow the standard operating procedures of the manufacturer. He must have that eagerness to obey what the manufacturer has stipulated in the different manuals how to operate safely the aircraft, not only to land but to fly. That's my job. In the course of my experience, I've allowed my co-pilots to do the landing. And sometimes some guys do a little bit hard landing. And I said, that's good. That's what Boeing says, do a firm landing. There are some guys who can do a very smooth landing. And I can see them look at me and say, waiting for me to commend. I said, what? How was it, Cap? How was what? For them, the focus is just on the landing. But to be a good pilot, it is how from the moment you take off till you land, you follow the operating manual. And in the course, there are number of circumstances that you would be faced with to handle. And you must know how the person who built the aircraft has stipulated in the manuals how to respond. Amos is something like that. He's preaching about the plumb line of God's judgment over Israel because they have deviated far off from what God has stipulated for them as his people, how they ought to live, how they ought to worship, how they ought to acknowledge. And that is what we are going to see this morning. So shall we just bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Our gracious Father, we thank you for this morning that we can worship you. Even that beautiful song that we sang, that your lamp is your lamp and light is for our walk. We need that light of your word. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. 
whatever perceptions we have of you, O oh God, forgive us. The Israelites had their own perception plans for how they ought to live. So would you speak to us and show us the importance of conforming to your laws, to what you have stipulated for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. About 25 years ago we did a little bit of renovation in our house back in Klang. We wanted to um, extend the wall further out so that the hall would be bigger and we wanted to put a big door right in the middle. We were all excited. Uh, the work started and he was almost putting up the wall and the door but I had a flight and I had to be away for a, about a week. So when I came back I was eager to see how it all turned up. Those of you who do renovation in your house, you know how excited you feel. When I came into the house and I sat down and I looked, it looked as though the doors were not straight. So I asked my wife, uh, is that okay? What okay? I said, the door, he said, it is straight. He said, yeah, it, uh, it's straight. I think you must be tired, you better go and sleep and come and look at it tomorrow morning. So the next morning I came again, sat there. Didn't seem right. So when the contractor came, he was a very experienced contractor, a very reliable contractor, a very honest contractor. And he came and asked him, hey, any butulga, straight guy in it. He laughed at me and he said, Yeah, butola, I said, Uko, he said, Uko, sana. Then I still was not happy. He asked his co worker, they all said it was straight. You know what he did? He ran to his car and brought a plumb line. Just like, similar to this one in the picture. The long string with a metal plumb at the bottom. And he came and he held it against the door. It was off very slightly by about a centimeter. <laughs> So I said, no, it's okay, just a little bit and it's all right. So the assistant said, no, 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 this one can be sorted out. You put another false beam at the side so that the door will look straight. You know what the contractor did? He broke the whole wall down. He brought the door down. I said, why did you do that? It's going to waste. You're wasting so much of time, money. He said, no, I must do it. You know what he told me? Every day you sit there and look at the door, you'll be cursing me. <laughs> Every time your friend comes to your house, he looks at the door and he says, hey, it's slightly off. <laughs> and you will remember me. I don't want you to remember me for that. I will do it. And he did it. Amos. In chapter 7, as a passage read to us by our dear sister, says that God had a plumb line against the wall. So turn with me to Amos chapter 7 and I want you to look at that carefully. Uh, this is what he showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb. The wall was originally built perfectly upright. The nation of Israel was divided into the northern kingdom and southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was called Israel and southern kingdom was called Judah. Jerusalem was in Judah. The temple of God was in Judah. Israel was ruled by Jehoboam. And he was not a good king. 
he was not a good king. He totally took the nation out of God's original way that he founded the church. God, in Deuteronomy you find that God had established Israel giving them commandments, statutes, instructions meticulously for everything, how worship is to be conducted, how the nation is to be run with justice and mercy. Everything was very clearly laid down. But Jehovah violated and led the people differently. If you want to look at 1 Kings chapter 12, that's where you read about what Jeroboam did. Then Jeroboam fortified Chechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. From there he went out and built up Pena. Jeroboam thought to himself, the kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David because they had to, it was mandatory for Jews to go to Jerusalem to worship. They cannot worship at any other place. They had to offer sacrifices in Jerusalem. So how is Jeroboam going to solve that problem? If people from the northern kingdom are going to travel to the southern kingdom, to Jerusalem, they might eventually decide to stay there. So it says, Jeroboam thought to himself, the kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David if these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem. They will again give their allegiance to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. They will kill me and return to King Rehoboam. He was more interested in his own survival, in preserving the kingdom for himself. The second thing he did was, after seeking advice, the king made two golden calves. You remember what people did when Moses went up the mountain? While they were waiting, they couldn't wait long. So they built a golden calf. And here he builds two, two golden calves. He said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Bethel was just north of Jerusalem. He tells them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Just imagine, Yahweh brought them out of Egypt. He says, these two golden calves brought you up. All this thing became a sin. The people went even as far as Dan to worship the one there. He set up two, car, two temples. Jeroboam built shrines on high places and appointed priests. The third thing he did, he appointed priests from all sorts of people. The priesthoods are supposed to come from the tribe of Levites. He appointed anyone he thought fit, even though they were not Levites. Fourthly, he instituted a festival on the 15th day of the eighth month, like the festival held in Judah. There are about three mandatory festivals that were very important for them to attend. The Feast of the Passover, the Feast of Weeks, Harvest Festival, and the Feast of the Tabernacle. You find that in Deuteronomy chapter 9. It was mandatory, and they can only worship, do celebrate these festivals in Jerusalem, where the temple of God was. So what he did, he too set up 
feasts to celebrate. He instituted a festival on the 15th day of the 8th month, like the festival held in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. Jeroboam took Israel totally against all what God had planned for Israel, his chosen people. And would you think that that was not reasonable for God to want to judge Israel? He had every right to do that. He was selfish. He was more concerned of himself. He looked for advice to wrong people rather than asking God or his prophets. He chose convenience rather than obedience. It was no longer about God's righteousness or seeking God's truth, but it was about what works best for you. And one compromise led to another. And God's plumb line stood straight, but the wall tilted. Wall can also mean the wall of the heart of the nation, the heart of his people. Corruption, he chose corruption rather than character. He made priests of any person. And God had very clearly said, they must be a Levite. But you know, amidst all this, we often think of the Old Testament where God is a God of wrath. But you know, God is also a God of compassion. We see he was patient. For nearly 200 years he gave them to repent and come back. He gave them prophets. Hosea, Amos, and many others over the 200 years. No, nothing could move him. And it so happened at the time when Amos was writing this book, it was a time of fairly peaceful. And they were doing very well. They were doing very well. And you know, in the Old Testament, very often, it, it's, uh, if you're doing well, then God is blessing you. Because otherwise God would have punished you. So they thought since God had not punished them, they're doing not too bad. That is the Jew Jewish theology equated prosperity with God's blessing. Under the Mosaic Covenant, God promised to bless his people if they obeyed his law, but to remove his blessing if they disobeyed. Find that in Deuteronomy 27 to 29. However, the people forgot that God often blessed, then blessed them in spite of their sins. That's the character of God not only for their sins, but sometimes in spite of their sins, God did bless them. Bless them with patience, kindness. In his love and patience, he sent them prophets, messengers, to call them back to obedience, but they refused to listen. And that is what we find as a prelude to chapter 7. It says in chapter, chapter 4, he not only used prophets, but he also gave them problems, discipline. He gave them famine, and yet he did not return unto me. Amos 4, 6. Drought, yet have you not returned unto me. 
disease on crops in chapter 4 verse 9 yet you have not returned and he keeps telling them yet you have not returned yet you have not returned then he also pleads with them not only gives them problem but he pleads with them in chapter 5 he says seek me and live do not seek battle seek me seek the Lord and live in verse 6 seek good not evil hate evil love good perhaps the Lord God Almighty will have mercy and this was going on for a long long time and then in the latter part of chapter 5 he says I hate I despise your religious feasts because those were not ordained by God I cannot stand your assemblies even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings I will not accept them though you bring choice fellowship offering I will have no regard for them away with the noise of your songs I will not listen to the music of your harps they were not founded on God's truth they were worshipping false god, idolatry. And then God holds the plumb line. He says, standing there by the wall that had been built true to the plumb, and with a plumb line in his hand, and the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, look, I'm setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be destroyed and the sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined. With my sword I will rise against the house of Jeroboam. How does this relate to us today? How does this relate to us today? God has ordained your life and my life as Christians because we have put our faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't come to abolish the law but to fulfill the law. So in him you find that every law was fulfilled. God is holy. He is just. And so he gave us his son. A sinless man to die for our sins so that justice would be done to sin so that you and I are now as Christians are upright righteous not of our own but what Jesus is clothed us with you know when I meditate on this there are a lot of questions that come to my mind. What is the plumb line that we measure, we determine as we build the walls of our hearts? What is it? Is it God's truth? Or what is convenient? What works best? God is a holy God. He searches us. He longs for us. He is patient with us. So that as and when our hearts tilt, being tempted and pulled by sin, He waits for us to put it straight. It's easier to correct the tilt when it's just happened. Because when that sin settles in, it is not impossible, but it is difficult. 
be it the sin of idolatry, of adultery, of pride, of selfishness, of greed, when we don't correct it early, the wall of our character gets affected. God is more interested in your character and my character. Not just in the outward forms of religiosity. And that is why he time and again calls us to examine ourselves. Not by the standards of a church, not by the standards of a community, not by the standards of the modern thinking, but by God's word. And you find that those who obeyed, honored, were blessed. Look at the life of Joshua. He was scared and trembled to take over the responsibility from Moses to lead the people of Israel into the promised land. He was scared, very scared. You read Joshua chapter one, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. He didn't stop there. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. And you may be successful wherever you go. In verse 8 he said, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. It's talking about the five books of the Old Testament. Do not let it depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. All that God asked of his people, of his leaders, of his kings, of his prophets, is to obey him. So that he could bless them. And his promise according to his covenant is, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. And that's the same promise we have in the New Testament. We can't hoodwink God. Yes, we can put a beam and cover up the, the tilt on the door. Or we can see it day after day. The crookedness looks like straight to us. We can easily be deceived. The, the sight can play tricks. Your feelings can be wrong. It feels straight, but it need not be straight unless I align it with the plumb line. And we need to do that. And God urges us to do that. And he has given us more than his word that the Old Testament people had. He has given us the Lord Jesus Christ himself, who set us an example in obedience to the Father in obedience to his command and he demonstrated his love in his humanity 
of love, of compassion, of kindness, of mercy. What a great God we have. And he has given us his Holy Spirit to keep a check how we are doing in our hearts. So this morning, my challenge to you as I challenge myself. Just as much as a pilot, if he wants to be a good, safe pilot, has to conform to the manufacturer's instruction. This is God's instruction for you and me. Let us not treat it lightly. Let us submit to it. Let us learn how to obey it. It's not easy. I stand here, I must confess, sometimes I find it difficult. Sometimes you find it difficult to love. Sometimes you find it difficult to give more of yourself. Sometimes the anger just comes up because of all the evil you see around. But yet God loved us and he wants us to love. May God help you and me that we would constantly take the plumb line and put it against the walls of our hearts and see if it is tilting. And when God shows us it is tilting, ask God to forgive us of that that has caused us to sin, that we would be brought back. That is what Christian living is all about. It is not just a perfect landing. It's good to have a good landing. But it is far more good to persevere, to be right with the God who loved us so much. This is my prayer for you. As we step into a new year, as we step with a new leadership, let us work together as a church that we will take this church in accordance to how God wants us to be. It is no point having this vision and mission statements. Let's make it a reality in our lives to reach out and touch lives that would please God. This is my prayer for you as I pray for myself. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for who you are. Sometimes it's far beyond us to fully comprehend all the many ways in which you operate. Sometimes we wish that your wrath will fall upon people who, who bring such great harm, hurt, wickedness in this world. God, if only you looked at us and dealt with us as to what we deserve, where would we be? So we thank you for your patience. We thank you for your love. We thank you for not giving up on us. Would you help us? Give us a heart that would seek to do things right, to do things well, to do things with love and bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name I pray.